this particular short talk is it takes a village. For us to address this issue of poverty, both the root causes and consequences of poverty is not a director's job, it's not a deputy director's job. I think it's really the village, all of us that care about this issue, and particularly because this is an issue that does not get talked about nearly the way it needs to in our communities. Maybe it gets talked about a little bit more in our communities, in our service systems, in our governments. And, and so, so that's really what I hope to do today is to kind of really marshal and galvanize support for a critically important agenda around poverty. Gary likes to say three years ago that he was the very first McSilver employee. Lonely days. He was. So, so we are a relatively new institute within New York University. And so I'm so appreciative of both the people and the funders that took a chance on trying to build something that I think, why did they take a chance on us? Because I think the mission is so important. And, and so this group is just some of the beginning funders that said, create an institute that makes real a change agenda so that young people, their families have what they need to succeed in New York City and to succeed in in, across the globe, that they have a chance to have a future, an education, a life. And so we're gonna focus today on, on a couple of issues that, that relate to a poverty and agenda. Hunger, food insecurity is our first panel. Homelessness, our second. To really think hard about how we collectively together can use our talents to address this particular issue. So again, the, the McSilver agenda to address root causes and consequences of poverty. I do think there's a couple of features of our institute that even though maybe not unique for all of you socially committed people in this room, I think makes us unique in a university environment. So, so I have to admit, um, and Gary didn't like this very much about me before, I, I'm a professor, I'm a researcher. And so typically, those researchers talk to each other, right? We go to conferences, we publish some journals, and those of you that work in systems, whether you're at the DOE, like Joshua Laub, whether you're in the mental health system, whether you're in corrections, you don't really read what we wrote. It, uh, it doesn't really make any difference, right? And, and so what I'm very proud about McSilver is that we have a very applied agenda. If we ask a question, who cares about the answer to that question? And what do we do with that information that will make a difference? And so very much focus on an action agenda, an applied research agenda. The other thing that, that I think that, that, that this slide just emphasizes, and those words are in red, is that there is really a set of issues related to race, related to racism, related to structural blocks and opportunities that some kids and families, it's Herculean efforts that they have to get over those obstacles. And so we're very much committed to talking about real issues, but difficult to talk about issues at McSilver and trying to include those issues in our research. The other thing that, that I think I'm particularly proud of around McSilver and then our prior work before McSilver, and those of you that are standing along the wall, there's a lot of seats could come on in and make yourself comfortable. Yes, come on in and make yourself comfortable. Perfect. So, so one of the things that I do think is important that, that I tell you about McSilver is that we really think about participatory research in a really critical way. And what makes participatory research special, we're thinking constantly around what's the direct benefit of the projects and the programs and the work that we do, and how do we get folks intensely involved in those particular projects. There is room in McSilver for you if you wanna make a difference. If you wanna sit on advisory boards, if you want to think about volunteering, if you want to think about offering solicited and unsolicited advice 
about what we should be concentrating on. And so it's that participation that we hope to generate as we go forward and build collaborations that can take on some of these very difficult to solve issues together. I also think that, that Gary is no longer lonely at McSilver. That in fact, a number of really talented community members, parent advocates, staff, researchers, from all different disciplines took a chance on this growing institute and tr are trying to make a difference in that mission. And so many of us are wearing these little badges. And, and so talk to the McSilver staff. Talk to our community collaborative board. Talk to members of the, the folks that we've worked with in our educational settings and our organizational and community settings and find out a little bit more about us. So I'm incredibly grateful to that team at McSilver. McSilver, you can go on our website, you can see the kind of range of projects that we're trying to do to improve you know, kids and families' lives, but I'll tell you just about two of them. If in the break you want to admire both these photographs to my, I guess that's my right, but also the photographs that you passed as you came in through the lobby, those photographs are created by a set of high school students right here in New York City. They're going to present later on their photo voice project through their eyes. What, is they, what do they see? What are the resources and assets available to them? But also, where are the places where they feel blocked in terms of a future and an opportunity? Step Up is one of the, the unique programs that is funded by the Robin Hood Foundation that is really a program developed by high school students for them. So youth voice, parent, family, community provider voice, policymaker voice, incredibly important to our agenda at McSilver. I think that many times you might say if you live in New York City that New York City has enough social issues, we have enough to do at home. And that is very true in New York City. But also many, many members of our community collaborative board, many members of our staff are connected to other places around the world that have tremendous disparities, tremendous inequities, and really places that, that in, in some cases communities where the world has actually let them left them behind. And, and so we do a lot of work around children, particularly around HIV prevention and care. This is one project that we have thankfully funded by the National Institute of Health that is really meant to support HIV positive children in South Africa. Now there's not just one or two children that were born with HIV in South Africa. We're approaching a half a million children that are trying to live with a chronic stigmatizing illness in South Africa. And so providing lots of supports, this is one example, and you can have lots of information on our website. So the last thing that I want to say before I call our panelists up today is that the two issues that we picked to, to be uh, uh, focused on today are issues that we want to focus on both how do we help individuals that are experiencing these issues, experiencing hunger, experiencing homelessness, but I think that's not enough. At this point, we understand that there are structural inequities, there are systems issues, there is a bigger set of challenges that homelessness doesn't become your individual burden as a family. It becomes the really ripe for collective acts, uh, action, how we help every child, every family, every adult have opportunities that they can eat, they can be sheltered, and they can have what they need to actually survive and thrive. And so I want us to really pay attention to both how we help individuals, individuals, but how we also think about what's the action agenda that comes out of this research. So with that, I'm going to ask Kara Dina Sale, Nisha Bahari, Joel Berg, and Sheena Wright. Did Sheena Wright actually, she's running a moment. Oh, there you are. Please to come up to the panel, and I'll introduce you. Uh, panel that, that we're going to talk, uh, the, the, the speakers are going to talk to today really focuses on food insecurity. So all of you have a program that can, uh, in this program contained really impressive bios of our speakers today. And so it is my privilege to be able to talk first about my two colleagues at McSilver, Kara Dina Sale and Nisha Bahari. And both Kara and Nisha are going to talk about some research that they've really been focused on around the intersection of food insecurity and school failure. 
We do a lot of work with our Step Up program. We have a very strong collaboration, I'm happy to say, with New York City Department of Education. And we do a lot around helping kids succeed in high school in chemistry and biology and math. Very complicated to succeed if you're hungry. And, and so many times we are putting tremendous resources into schools. We're, we're bolstering teachers. We're making sure that they have the resources and we haven't concentrated on some of kids' basic needs. And so Karen and uh, Nisha are gonna talk about uh, some of our findings around food insecurity and some of those findings are actually contained in Food Matters, what is also in your program. A summary of some of the research that, the beginning research that McSilver is working on. After Karen and Lydia sit down, they're gonna be followed by Joel Berg, who is the executive director of the National New York City Coalition Against Hunger. I also hear he lives two subway stops away, so I'm glad we could make it convenient. So Joel's gonna to talk to us today a little bit about the work he does across New York City. And followed by Sheena Wright, who raced here uh, to get here from, she is the president and CEO of the United Way of New York City. All these speakers have incredible talents that they're gonna share with us. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, Kara's gonna go first. So my name is Kara Dinaseo, and I am the clinical, co-director of the Clinical Education and Innovation Department at the McSilver Institute. So there's gonna be a lot of McSilver pride today. And it's very exciting. Um, I wanted to start by telling you about my experience with food insecurity and why I'm really interested in the topic. I'm from West Virginia but I came to New York uh, many, many times in my childhood. I had some relatives that lived here. And every Thanksgiving, my father and I would take food to those who didn't have any. And it was such an amazing experience and also eye-opening, and I think really pushed me to be a social worker. I've been a social worker for about 14 years, and food justice and social justice issues have been very important to me. So after college, I moved to New York about 20 years ago. Um, so I guess I'm now a native. Is that how it works? Um, and I joined a volunteer corps where I lived like my neighbors and I had a very small stipend and had to stretch my budget and often struggled with food, you know, towards the end of the month especially. But I learned if I could eat in the middle of the day, it'd be okay. I learned that I could get an egg roll for a dollar and that would hold me over. Um, and that brings me to today. So I, li I moved to the Hudson Valley about four years ago and I work right now on a project called Fairground Community Cafe, where we're working to open a community cafe that serves food to everyone and anyone. So you can either pay what you can or you can volunteer in exchange for a meal. So I want to just, though, start with the definition. So what is food insecurity? So we're going to hear that a lot today, and I'm really happy about it. Not happy that it happens, but happy that we're talking about it, because I think it's going to change. So here's one definition, thanks to the Oxford Dictionary. So the state of being without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable and nutritious food. Really important. Access to nutritious, affordable food, right? The um, USDA is also looking at several other definitions right now where they're uh, called low food insecurity and very low food insecurity. So low food insecurity is looking at uh, hunger, but not real uh, depletion and in intake. But very low in, uh, food insecurity is also looking at reduced in intake and disruption and eating patterns. So we're really moving in this movement in many different ways, along with the definition as well. So why is it important? So I talked about uh, the community cafe that I'm, I'm working on upstate, and I met a wonderful woman named Jackie, and Jackie said to me, she resurrected the summer food program. She's an amazing woman, and she said to me, Kara, you won't believe how many kids are hungry in this town. And I said, you're right, I don't believe it. But Jackie and I won't even believe these numbers. So 49 million Americans, and this is just of 2012, so, since then, we know something called SNAP has been decreased. So these numbers are even higher now. So 49 million Americans, 15.9 million children, 17.6 million households. Most households are headed by single mothers. And then 4.8 million seniors. So that's why this is really important to us. But even more so, 
Children who experience food insecurity have, are more frequently ill. They have poor academic performance, especially in regards to math and reading. There are higher obesity rates. And there are more serious emotional and social difficulties that they experience. We've also found in our thorough research at the Institute that kids who experience severe hunger have had more experience with trauma in their lives. And mothers also have, thank you, also have had, um, who've experienced severe hunger also have a lifetime diagnosis of PTSD, substance abuse, and or anxiety. So this is why this is important to us. So I'm gonna leave on this note, and then uh, my colleague Nisha and I, who've been working on this along with Mary for a little while, we're very excited. How, um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> thank you, and it's a privilege to be here um, with McSilver and others um, to, to talk about, as Karen Mary had mentioned, this extremely important issue. And, um, and I think what drives my work with food insecurity is that I've had family members who, in an, who have been in and out um, of um, experiencing food insecurity and have had to rely on, on SNAP <clears throat> from time to time, but also that when you think about nationally who food insecurity affects the most, it's typically children and other vulnerable populations. And when you think of the justice issues around that, it, it sort of kind of should move you to, to want to do something about it and to change it. And I think that's why we're all here today. So. Um, so I'm going to talk really briefly about some of our recent findings. Um, is this moving? Am I sparking? Is it on? And Nisha, you're going to just talk about our findings? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, right. Um, so the findings that um, I'm going to talk about today are from the National Survey of Children's Health and the, la the latest wave of two the 2011 wave of that data. And it included over 95,000 households with children between the ages of birth to 17. And what really drove our, our research agenda with this particular data set was the debate that's been going around um, that we've probably all been hearing about related to SNAP whether we should um, keep the status quo, whether we should increase it given that we're recovering from a recession, or whether we should um, get rid of it completely. Um, and so we, <clears throat> we wanted to look at a subsample of those families who were living below the poverty line. Um, and we were able to then compare those who were eligible for SNAP and those who were not eligible for SNAP um, uh, I'm sorry, to compare those who are eligible for SNAP um, to those who were um, receiving SNAP. Um, and so, <clears throat> okay, okay, good. Yes, yeah, so, right, so going back to the first research question, so basically looking at those living below the poverty line, we were able to compare those who qualified for SNAP but weren't participating in the program to those who were participating in the SNAP program. <clears throat> on various uh, social, economic, and, um, and, uh, and other, and demographic variables related to families. Um, our other, our second research question was how does economic hardship or material hardship affect educational outcomes? And specifically, we were looking at difficulty affording basic necessities, which included food. And lastly, we were interested in looking at how SNAP uh, participation affects um, educational outcomes for, for these children living in poverty as well. There we go, thank you. Um, so basically our findings su suggest that these, the families participating in SNAP are more economically strained. So more specifically, they actually have more difficulty affording basic necessities. They have, um, they have more children to provide for and less adults to, to bring in income, typically in the household. Um, and have, as Karen mentioned, it sort of um, supported the past literature that had suggested that these families are experiencing higher rates of trauma. So incredibly strained families. And these are the families who we're thinking of 
um, when, we're, when we're debating whether or not to cut SNAP or not. Um, so the second finding was related to difficulty affording basic necessities and uh, that being associated with poor educational outcomes. And in particular, we looked at caring about school, <clears throat> completing homework, and missing 11 or more days of school, and repeating a grade. And then, and we found that across the board, not surprisingly, those who were experiencing difficulty affording basic necessities, including food, had poor educational outcomes. Lastly, um, we were looking at SNAP participation and how it impacted um, educational outcomes. And we found that it actually helped children to not repeat a grade, which is huge when you think about the, the trajectory, um, the life trajectory of, the children, of children and, and how repeating a grade can impede that progress and, and future steps. So, um, and more specifically, they're less likely to graduate from high school and they're more likely to, to be engaged in the juvenile justice system, which has huge personal and societal costs as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mary to talk a little bit about um, the implications of these findings. So if I'm a teacher in the room, or, or if I work for the DOE, I say, I knew that. Hunger interferes with kids learning. It's one of those academic questions like what? You had to do a study, Nisha had to like, analyze data to, to kind of say that, that you know kids that are hungry have difficulty in school. And yet, how we use that knowledge in our current educational policy, in our current health policy, in our current social service policy, not so much. So, so we treat this as knowledge that is given, and yet how our educational system changes as, as a result of whether McSilver finds something or another researcher like this finds something, how we change our health policy, how we change what we fund in terms of integrated social services and mental health services or substance use services. That's, I think, really what, what I, I think it gets to actually our next two speakers really well, which is we know that food insecurity, hunger is bad for kids. We could actually potentially maybe stop the academic failure with making sure their families had enough to feed them but it requires change in policy and in integrating what we do in a way that, that takes advantage and, uh, and really recognizes what Kara and Nisha found. So many people are suffering from hidden hunger. Their quality of life will be compromised, particularly young children. We all work together on confidence that we can eliminate hunger, whether it's visible or hidden by 2025. And I said, who said that? Well, somebody said that a doctor in front of their name, the director general, but I hadn't read it. And I'm not sure that the head of some of our systems have incorporated necessarily that knowledge. And so finally, I want to say just one other word about research. It's really important, Nisha and Kara, what you did. You analyzed a big data set. It's not one child that's hungry, two children that's hungry. There are thousands and thousands of nationally representative kids and families in that data set. But secondary data doesn't give you the voice of the actual children, doesn't give you the voice of actual families. And so McSilver is also working very hard now to field another study where young people, families, communities can have voice and participation in, in how we use those findings for advocacy. My hope is that our next two speakers have some answers for how we can translate what we know into what we do so that kids and families have a better shot. And I'm gonna leave you with one more as I introduce Joel Berg. Food insecurity when all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active life. My hope is that, Joel, you're gonna tell us a little bit about what you, your organization, and what we can do to actually make that a reality. So I'll, I'll introduce Joel Berg, and then Sheena, you'll follow right after. Thank you. I'm thrilled you've asked me to come here to speak today about the impact of uh, working conditions for construction workers in Abu Dhabi on poverty. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, you know, actually, you know, poverty in New York City is a big issue. But just within 10 blocks of where we're standing, you can basically tell the whole story of poverty in New York City in a microcosm. Where we are today, I believe, until very recently, was the Salvation Army. 
providing social services. It no longer is. I'd ask you to consider, as this august cultural institution does this vital work here, what happened to those social services. <coughs> Down the block, just around the corner, is it was a food pantry that no longer is in operation because they ran out of food. For all the talk on the right that the soup kitchens and food pantries will pitch in and do the work. Now, you know, Sheena and the United Way and our tax dollars provide a lot of great support for these pantries and kitchens. But you understand, I hope you understand, that's 1 20th, 1 20th of the amount of the Federal Nutrition Assistance Safety Net, even as underutilized as that Federal Nutrition Assistance Safety Net is. Every pound of food distributed by every soup kitchen, food pantry, food bank, and food rescue group in America and New York City is less than 1 20th of what the federal safety net provides or doesn't provide. Right across the street, this is perfect, right across the street is an office of the New York City Human Services Administration, Human Resources Administration, the Social Services Agency for New York City. Today in New York City, there are at least 600,000 people, 600,000 people eligible for food stamps, SNAP benefits that aren't getting them. Over the last year, even though poverty has been soaring, homelessness has been soaring, unemployment has remained stable at a ridiculously high level, there's been more than 100,000 person drop in food stamps participation in New York City. The new administration's focused on that. They know there's a problem and they're trying to correct it. But that is a massive drop. Combined with that, with the cut on November 1st in SNAP residents, and every month in New York City, low-income New Yorkers are getting more than $100 million less than they were getting a year ago. Just one month. It's going to be a, you know, a billion dollars less uh, uh, over the year. Those are the stakes. Those are the stakes. And what does that mean for this neighborhood? What does that mean for this city? It means in Borham Hill, you may have seen a story in the New York Times a few years ago, that a census tract just a few blocks from here has the highest level of inequality in the entire city, and probably the highest level in the entire United States, because it's got public housing and very expensive brownstones just down the block. It means a little closer to my house in Prospect Heights. About uh, 12 years ago, the city was going to bring in a very, very, very small homeless shelter for mostly women and children. And all my ultra-liberal neighbors went nuts. Let me just be blunt uh, about it. There was a big rally against the shelter. I think 150 people showed up, myself and two friends with only people for it, and people threatened us with bodily harm because they said this homeless shelter was going to bring all this turmoil and destruction and chaos to the city of New York and, and to our illustrious neighborhood. <laughs> By the way, uh, the site of that homeless shelter is now a parking lot for Atlantic Yards. <clears throat> I'm just telling you the reality uh, here. What does this mean? What this means because of our failed policies, today in New York City, there are over 1.3 million of our neighbors living in households that can't afford enough food. 1.3 million of our neighbors. Half a million children. One in five New York City children live in these homes. In the richest city, in the history of the world. Now, I'm a committed capitalist. My mother came here from Poland at two months old, was able to go to NYU. My father was born in the Bronx. His all my grandparents were born elsewhere. They came here and built a better life for their kids through opportunity capitalism. But we've lost that. Today in New York City, the 56 wealthiest New Yorkers have a combined net worth of $180 billion. The entire city budget covering every fire, fighter, every cop, every teacher, every public health facility, every road, is about a third that. So understand, the 56 wealthiest New Yorkers have three times the money as the entire city budget. The argument that we can't afford to fix this, I'll put this in polite academic terms. <laughs> it's a bold-faced lie told by the people who have a vested interest in repeating that line. Now, I assume you guys believe in science, right? Hard physical science. I know, you know, people say evolution's only a theory, so it can't be proven. <coughs> uh, gravity's only a theory, right? So that can be, anyone want to bet me that these keys are going to hit the podium? I do that demonstration all over the country, and you know what? It works every time. And then I challenge people, do you believe social science is real? Do you believe we can measure social science? Well, we should. 
And we know that over the last four or five decades, since 1959, we've measured poverty in America. And all the things one side said created poverty have been measured against what the other side said has created poverty. And guess what? We have actual data over a few decades nationwide. Every single time we invested in people, created jobs, invested in education, invested in nutrition and housing programs, and goodness forbid made the wealthiest pay their fair share of taxes to pay for it. And by the way, in the Eisenhower administration, the wealthiest paid 94% of their income in taxes. Now it's 39.6%. Every time we did that, poverty went down. Every time we cut those programs, not to truly reduce the deficit, but to give more tax cuts to the billionaires, poverty went up. In the 90s, when I was working for President Clinton, people said, oh, the reason we have poverty is low-income people aren't working hard enough, they're all on welfare, you know, they're taking too many drugs, they're having too many babies, and that's why we have all this poverty. Well, you know, we did get rid of welfare as we know it. In New York City, there are three million people poor enough to get Medicare, oh, a Medicaid, Medicaid, 1.8 million people getting SNAP, food stamps, and only a few 300,000 or so getting cash assistance. We basically eliminated you know, cash welfare. Less than 10% of the poor people in America, less than 10% of the poor people in America get cash assistance. So we eliminated welfare. Teenage pregnancy went down. As you know, in New York and other big cities, violent crime went down. The crack epidemic waned. And guess what? Poverty increased. The facts show it's not about behavior. The facts show it's about an economy that has been destroyed and no longer pays living wage jobs and that we've outsourced living wage or poverty. <laughs> What's the New York City Coalition Against Hunger doing about it in 150, uh, one minute and 58 seconds? Uh, we uh, work generously funded by the United Way to help people access food stamps benefits, SNAP benefits. We are working on to increase school breakfast participation in New York City. You heard all about the devastating impact of lack of uh, healthy kids, meals for kids. Out of 63 school districts in the United States, big school districts, New York City is dead last. As self-evident, based on actual data, that breakfast is vital, the previous mayor really didn't believe hunger existed in New York City and believed Get this, he thought feeding kids school breakfast increased obesity. We're working to reverse that. Uh, we work to redefine the way people volunteer, and you can go to hungervolunteer.org and find how. Do not, do not, I beg you, beg to show up with a group of 50 people on Thanksgiving. Please don't do a food drive. If you needed prescription drugs for your grandmother, you wouldn't tell everyone to go in the medicine cabinet and donate what you think someone else's you know, grandmother would need. Instead, use your professional skills to help us. We have a CSA program bringing fresh produce into low-income neighborhoods and subsidizing it, proving that it's not about low-income people not knowing what to eat or being too lazy. They can't afford it and it doesn't exist. When you build it, they will come. And most importantly, we are doing research, communication, and advocacy work. This is a solvable problem. We almost entirely ended hunger in America and New York City in the 1970s because we had more living wage jobs and a more serious safety net. If you go to Sweden, that's a country that used to have massive hunger and poverty. That's why there's so many Swedish people in the Midwest. They eliminated it. And Sweden, unlike Norway, didn't get a lot of oil. They changed their government policies. You know, Dr. King used to talk about the paralysis of analysis. And I believe very, very deeply in the need for informed data to further support our efforts. But let us not believe we have to study this to act. We didn't further need to study slavery to know it was wrong and needed to be fixed. We didn't need to further study child labor to know it was wrong and needed to be fixed. We don't need to further study poverty to know that 1.3 million people going without food in a city with so many billionaires they can't even all fit on the Forbes 400 list is wrong and we need to fix it now. Thank you. Yeah, I, I am going to be brief because I think it's really important that we hear from the group here that is assembled uh, to talk about these issues and really answer your questions. Uh, I certainly won't restate the problem. I think uh, my esteemed colleagues have done that uh, very well. I mean, we, we understand what the issue is, that obviously hunger is, is about, um, it's about poverty, it's about income, it's about not having enough uh, resources to meet your expenses, your life expenses. And I think Joel uh, certainly you know, put the, the hammer uh, 
down in terms of some key, key things around uh, activating us and, and what some things that we need to do. So I, I briefly want to just talk a little bit about what the United Way of New York City is doing and then also just briefly talk about um, some solutions and, and some real steps that we need to take and we, we need to continue to take as we move forward and maybe even sum up a little bit uh, of what we discussed here so far. As, as, as you know, Joel is one of our partners, uh, as well as many other nonprofits in the city around the hunger issue, which, as we said, is essentially about poverty. Our mission and our focus is on breaking down barriers and building opportunities for low income New Yorkers all over the city with the ultimate benefit for everybody in New York, because we very much appreciate that um, as, as income disparate as a city that we live in. The, the impact of impoverished neighborhoods and communities really hurt everybody in the city. And, and for the missed opportunity and potential, the things that we need to drive new jobs and to drive our economy, the innovation that's required, uh, it, it has to come from all of our citizens. And we can't have people that are left out. We can no longer uh, be a successful country with the caste system that we have in place. And I think one of the things that's important to appreciate about the root causes of this, the United States of America is built on a caste system. That's who we are at our core. We're not Finland or Sweden or any of these other places that are small and appreciate, appreciated and recognized that they needed every single one of their citizens to reach their full potential in order for them to be successful countries. The United States of America was very, very clear in its founding and its history, that it wanted to make sure that there were some people that had access to opportunity and that there were others that did not. And, and that's how we were built, and that is really the genesis of the challenges we have today. Where we are today is that we are, we are an information um, uh, economy, and therefore we can no longer direct people in terms of making sure that they have poor educational opportunities, insufficient resources for housing and food and everything else. Uh, we, need, we need everyone to be able to, to contribute to the economy. So that's, that's part of the reason, I think that's a huge part of the reason that we're, we're in such challenge and such trouble today, because we still have policies that are very much focused on making sure that we keep a caste system in place. Um, you know, there was just a recent report, uh, we just celebrated the 60th anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And I think it's interesting that here in New York City, we have um, you know, not only the most segregated school system in the country, in New York City, but we still have a profound disparity in underfunding of schools in New York City from the state by design. Even though there was a lawsuit uh, several years ago that said this is inappropriate and directed the governor to, to uh, rectify the situation and it hasn't been done. So we, we still are living in this, in this significant paradigm. So the United Way of New York City is very, very focused on uh, combating these issues and addressing them programmatically, but also from, from a policy systems change perspective. As Joel said, you know, we are one of the largest funders of emergency food uh, programs in the city of New York, funding nearly 500 food pantries and soup kitchens in every single borough of the city. We are a big, huge funder in access to uh, food stamps and those benefits as well, as well as emergency shelter programs and food programs. And we are very, very focused as well on advocacy and policy, and Joel talked a little bit about that, and we know that advocacy and organizing and the voice of people impacted is what is going to actually d develop a change and a shift in the systems that we need. So there are basically, I would say, two or three roads that we need to go down. One is that we certainly need to continue to fund emergency food provisions and services and resources and, and, and the like, and make sure that we increase access to food stamps and other income supports that are currently available. The second is that we need to advocate and secure additional resources for the income support programs and initiatives that exist and we, we know do work. Uh, one of the things I was asked to do was to, to share a little bit of a personal story and some of um, the colleagues up here did as well. 
Uh, I am a native New Yorker, an actual native New Yorker, like born in. <laughs> if you've been here 20 years, you, you're a New Yorker, but a native New Yorker requires, you know, you gotta be born here, and, uh, but that's okay. Uh, you are a New Yorker, and uh, born in the South Bronx um, in the 70s, in the, in the period that was described a little bit, uh, to a teenage mother who was 17 uh, by the time she had me and my older sister. She started when she was 15. And, but for, the income supports that my mother received, including food stamps, including rental assistance and others, she would not have been able to continue to progress her own education. She never stopped going to school, completing her high school degree, completing her college degree at Hunter College, and completing two master's degrees. And that really created the runway of success for me and my sister, who were able to attend um, uh, private boarding schools for, for uh, high school and go on, and I graduated from Columbia undergraduate and Columbia Law School, and my sister graduated from Vassar College. And she certainly experienced, you know, she, she appreciated hunger and, and lack of resources, and it, if it were not for those income supports, she would have had to work three jobs as opposed to two jobs, and she would not have been able to advance her education. She would have not have been able to get the resources necessary to make sure that my sister and I could achieve our full potential. These are really critical things. President Obama is an example. Um, of his mother benefiting from food stamps, allowing her to go to nursing school to continue her degree and, and excel in her profession so she could provide opportunities for him so that he can be the president of the United States. So one of the things that we need to do uh, a lot of, more of, is really change the face of, of and, and also what these benefits lead to in terms of outcomes. It's, it's not just um, the, the belly is no longer growling, but it's about the other opportunities, the, the potential that is able to be reached. Education uh, was talked about certainly um, as well. We know the impact of hunger and, and insufficient resources uh, for low-income families. We have on educational opportunities. Work that I did in Harlem for about a decade. Another example is we were uh, working with a particular school that was surrounded by homeless shelters. And out of the 400 students, maybe 120 of them had come from the shelters. And we were in there talking about you know, the curriculum and, and resources around uh, the, the uh, educational system. And the principal looked at me and she said, I know that the kids that are coming, they, they come in late, these you know, 200 and so kids, they haven't eaten since lunch the day before, they're wearing the same clothes that they've had on for the past four days, and you wanna to talk to me about the curriculum? I need you to help me feed them first, make sure that they have you know, the clothes that they need and other resources that they need, and then we can talk about that. But those, those are some significant, real barriers to uh, education and making sure that our young people can reach their full potential, absolutely. So we have to continue to unfortunately kind of put our finger in the dike in terms of providing the emergency services that are necessary, but ultimately we've got to shift policy, and you know, one of the things that was touched on briefly, and Joel certainly touched on it quite a bit, is that we need living wage jobs. Um, we are uh, funding a study right now by the Women's Economic Center, which really calculates what does it really cost to live in New York City, in each borough. If you have to factor in your grocery bill, housing costs, the doctor, I mean, no frills, like you don't have like cable, like we have, you might have just have the few channels. What would it actually cost to live without any assistance and support? In 2010, for a family, I think of three, a single mother, that number was $60,000. A $15 hour job doesn't cover it. So that is a huge uh, part of the solution, and I have my zero time up, and uh, I'm, we're looking forward to hearing questions from the audience. So we do have time to hear from the talent in this room as well for questions for our panelists, comments, uh, recommendations, um, so that, that we hope that you will fully participate with us and talk back with us as well. Questions? Please. Um, hi, uh, talk, if you stand up and talk as loud as you can. Sure, sure, sure. Hello, everybody. That's perfect. Uh, 